please come in and join us. I guess this is live. There we go. It's working. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ann Poe, and I'm a city councilwoman at large, but I also have the honor of being the council liaison to the Historic Preservation Commission. And I have to tell you it, what a joy it is to come into these council chambers every single week. When we um, have the opportunity to have meetings in here, we have our council meetings in here uh, twice a month, but we also on occasion will have special meetings. But what you see around you, um, I just guess I get goosebumps. It's absolutely beautiful. I'd like to uh, shout out to our staff, Sandy Fowler, Seth, and um, Kirsten. We really appreciate, Kirsty, we really appreciate the work that you've done um, in helping us move this forward. So thank you very much. We appreciate you being here tonight. And again, I'm very honored to be able to um, talk with you this evening. You gotta be flexible if you're a city councilwoman. <laughs> These murals were painted by a group of Iowa artists who were hired by the U.S. Treasury Department in 1936. They were tasked with helping bring the American dream to a sharper focus and to use their artistic talents to tell the sweeping story of American life, law, and culture. After the murals were painted over in 1951, the community lost this unique cultural heritage until now. We are delighted you have joined us as we continue the story of the council chamber murals. And we hope you'll join us on May 13th for the final ad address. Our first lecture, lecture on, held on March 11th focused on the North Wall and set the stage for us to learn more about this unique and creative group of artists who joined together in a shared vision for artistic and political independence. Tonight, we continue our journey on the South Wall. Painted by Harry Donald Jones, this mural depicts our legacy from earlier cultures and shows how our own contemporary culture is affected by the past. As you will see, the restoration work is also continuing on the East Wall Mural, which will be unveiled during the May 13th lecture. Tonight, conservator Scott Hoskins will share more about the recent discovery that was revealed as this restoration work took place. Following tonight's lecture, you are welcome to ask our speakers questions or get up and take a closer look at the restoration work underway. It's now my ple pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speakers, Scott Hoskins and Leah Rawson DeLong. Scott is the president and chief conservator of the Fine Arts Conservation Laboratories of Santa Barbara, California. In 1978, he gr graduated from the prestigious art conservation program and Botticino, Russia, Italy, prior to joining the Fine Arts Conservation Laboratories in 1986, Scott was the conservator of the Fine Arts for Brigham Young University and held a private practice that worked extensively in Utah and Italy. In, in 2013, Scott led the team that restored the south wall of the mural in Cedar Rapids City Council Chambers. Leah Rawson DeLong is an art historian and a curator from Des Moines. Her BA from the University of Oklahoma, her MA and PhD from the University of Kansas. She taught at Drake University and Iowa State University and served on the curatorial staff of the Des Moines Art Center. She is currently a guest curator 
at the University Museums of Iowa State University. She is the author of several books on Grant Wood and the sculptor Christian Peterson, New Deal Art of the Midwest, and numerous articles, catalogs, and books on American art of the 1930s and contemporary art. Please join me with our first speaker, Leah Rawson DeLong. Thank you. Hello. Well, I, I may have to just put re, uh, revive my professorial voice in, in light of this. Uh, my can. Now, uh, I am delighted to be here again. Is this working at all? Bring it up closer. Yeah. All right, I'll kind of point it on my chin there. All right. Uh, I am delighted to be back in Cedar Rapids, and I am thrilled about your murals. Even art historians have their moments. And when I learned that these were not lost, that we were going to get them back, it was one of the most thrilling parts of my career. Because for over 20 years, I've been lecturing to people about New Deal art in Iowa. And one of the things I always had to say is that we have lost two of the four major mural cycles. We had four of them. Lost two of them. Actually, we've only lost one of them but we really have lost that one. But this one isn't lost. So thank you, thank you to Cedar Rapids for bringing this back to us, not just to you in Cedar Rapids, not just to us in the state of Iowa, but truly to the nation. This mural <clears throat> is a treasure. Now, the one back there we talked about last time, that was painted by the man who was the head of the team. This one is the one that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, and as you've already learned, this was done by Harry Donald Jones. When you look at it more closely, you'll be able to see his signature up there, and he stated it, 1936, 1937. We're going to a good deal about this uh, panel at the very far end. I know you can't see it very well because of the scaffolding, but you'll see it well enough, and you'll be able to make the comparison between that what you have on your wall and this very, very famous painting by Jose Clemente Orozco. Now, in our last lecture, we discussed the first wall, designed and painted by Francis Robert White while on the overall theme of law and culture. That's the overall theme of your mural cycle. To do with the history of the Midwest, with the settling of the area, with its attendant dispossession of the land by, from the native tribes, the building up of the economy with the steamboat and the locomotive and the forces of labor, now I mean labor with a capital L, this is the 1930s, including minority workers, which is unusual, and the depiction of a contemporary farm and factory. All of that is back there. We observe the dynamism of that composition as White tried to deal with the large and powerful forces that created our distinctive culture in America and the American Midwest. And then you'll make some visual comparisons later between the way he composed his wall and the way Jones composed this wall here. Let's review briefly how these murals came about and why we refer to them as New Deal murals. The stock market crash of October 1929 crashed, that crushed the American economy. Within weeks, unemployment was starting to skyrocket and thousand be thousands began to feel its effects. The United States population in 1929 was about 122 million. In 1930, the crash was in 19 late 1929. In 1930, four million people were unemployed. Now that means four million in the workforce, four million heads of households. Four million unemployed. The next, it, uh, it, by 1931, doubled. Eight million people unemployed. 1932, the next year, 12 million heads of households out of work. Not just lazy, no jobs. Let's look at Iowa farm income. It came from a high of about a billion dollars in 1919. That was just after the, the wheat, um, um, uh, the wheat uh, rise in the, at the end of World War I. And then in 1929, Iowa farm income was 347 million. million dollars. Oh, there it goes. Did you get that? $13 million. Okay. That's how far it had gone. That's how, that's how bad it is, was. It was a massive problem on an unprecedented scale. 
Franklin Roosevelt was elected in 1932 on a campaign promise for a new deal for the common man. The New Deal came to mean his program to alleviate the conditions of the American population during the Great Depression of the 1930s. So that's the New Deal. His New Deal developed all sorts of public programs for public works, putting the unemployed to work. Among those who were unemployed in especially high numbers were, of course, artists. And Roosevelt included them in his New Deal. For the first time, the American government was involved in the support of our national culture. The goal of the New Deal art programs was not just to put artists to work, but to give the American people works of art that were available to everyone, not just the well-to-do or the people who lived in big cities where the art museums were, but to everybody, to the American public. They also wanted to use art to address the crisis of confidence, a sort of artistic, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The arts agencies of the New Deal hired artists to paint murals that depicted American history in every dimension. The American economy, from urban areas to small towns to the countryside, and of course, we love to paint our own landscape. And you see some elements of that in this mural. The New Dealers who formed these art ag arts agencies wanted Americans to think about what they already had accomplished in building up their nation, the resources that they still had, and especially their own strength and endurance as people. People often say that the U.S. had never come closer to revolution than it did during these er early and dark days of the Depression. And the New Deal was trying to address the deep distress, the deep emotional, not just economic, but deep distress of the American people. The New Deal funded four main arts agencies. One of them was the WPA, which became a kind of a generic term for all of the art produced for the American people during the New Deal. This particular mural, as we already know, was, public, was uh, produced under a different program, the TRAP, the Treasury Relief Art Program. Now, to get on this program, the artist had to be on relief. In other words, he had to be in dire financial need. But they also had to have established a record as a fine artist. Harry Donald Jones, our artist here, had such a record. His work had been accepted into national art exhibitions, such as the Art Institute's Annual Survey of American Painting, and so he was well qualified. The, um, the thing Earl was inherited American culture, by which he meant primarily the cultures that existed here before contact and the influence of the Mexican culture. Now, why is it that we have such an emphasis on Mexico in this mural in Cedar Rapids? Well, many American artists were just in a mood of what had gone on in Mexico in the 1920s. After the Mexican Revolution, an art movement arose in Mexico, which used the walls of public buildings to paint the history of the Mexican people and to encourage reform of their economic, social, and political systems. Social justice was an important theme, as was recognizing the contributions of the common people, not just the elite or the wealthy. The idea of using these large public spaces to comment on their own society, the idea that artists were important in creating and sustaining a culture of balance and a culture of humanity, the idea that painting murals in a style that was both modern and yet interesting and understandable to the average person, all of these were ideas that generated out of the Mexican mural movements and were embraced by American artists. American artists by the hundreds went to Mexico to see the murals for themselves, including White and Jones. Both went to Mexico. <coughs> he actually even met Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco, who painted the mural, or painted the image that's on the, on the screen over, up over there. Orozco was, and, and both of those artists, many of the Mexican artists actually painted murals, were commissioned to paint murals in the United States under private patronage. Orozco was painted to th uh, commissioned to paint the walls of the library at Dartmouth College up in New Hampshire, and his theme was the epic of American civilization. And I think you can agree that that's almost the name that you could give for, to this entire mural cycle, but they couldn't because Orozco's already got it. When he was assigned a wall in the Cedar Rapids courthouse, the image that begins his wall over here, Jones's wall, is of Orozco 
painting his mural at Dartmouth. And that's what you're seeing. That is the finished image that Orozco painted. And he probably chose this particular image because it was the most famous image from this mural cycle. So that anybody who looked at this image from the 1930s might very well know, oh, OK, we know exactly who that artist, artist is. That's Orozco. They would know. Many people would know that image. Uh, among the Orozco's well, themes in his work is the necessity for cooperation. That's a, fa that's a very important word in understanding uh, 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 American art of the 1930s. The necessity for cooperation and education in human society. Establishing the conditions for creativity and progress and rejecting the forces of oppression and ignorance. What should society do to foster conditions that benefit the greatest number? Orozco depicts Christ as the ultimate reformer. And I'm just going to read you from the script that Dartmouth has for this. And this is why I'm describing Orozco's depiction over here of Christ with this axe and, the, and his cross is there behind him. In the apocalyptic climax of the mural cycle, a defiant resurrected Christ, painted in acid colors and shedding his skin to reveal a newly enlivened body, returns in judgment to sweep away ideologies and institutions that thwart contemporary um, human emancipation and spiritual renewal. Hold on. You're, who not? By destroys the, the sources of his agony. Military armaments and religious and cultural symbols are here relegated to the junk heap of history behind him. So that's what they're thinking. At the time he painted our mural, Jones had not yet actually visited Dartmouth to see the Orozco images. So he painted the image from an already published photograph. But after he was through with these, he actually did go to Dartmouth to look at the murals. Before he began work on that, now, where did he get the idea for some of these specific things, some of the specific forms that he's got in his murals here? Before he began work on this cedar mural, Joan? Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly. I never know. <laughs> Eli Lilly had a collection of artifacts that he had taken from some excavations of some mounds near Indianapolis. And that was in his collection. And while Jones was there visiting a friend who was painting a mural for Eli Lilly, Jones saw those. And that's what found their w its way into his work. Now, we've already talked a little bit about the main, the, the first part over there of Orozco's mural. Let's look at, okay, you can walk around with it. Let's look at this one here. What you see here are the, the mounds, uh, the Indian burial mounds of the Midwest. And you can see that he shapes his mural form to suggest specifically the burial mounds. See how he has that arching form over there? That's for that reason, to suggest the mound builders of the American Midwest. You can see that it's on the farmer's land because there's the farmhouse and there's the, mid, the windmill. The windmill is a symbol for the American Midwest, and so that shows you exactly where this is taking place. And we can't tell if this is a farmer. He's wearing his overalls, which is a 1930s uniform for an agricultural person, or an archaeologist. But you can see here that he is unearthing a skeleton in the mound there. And you can see other archaeological forms. You can also see how very carefully He's going through these forms so that he doesn't mess up the layers. You can see that this, there's a round form there that is probably the sieve through which he shakes out the dust and leaves the small shards or objects in on the screen. So this is an image of the mounds. Work. So the, and the idea is that when, we, when those mounds were uncovered, there were many objects there that made it very clear that there had been trade and contact between the Mexican culture, specifically the Mayan culture, and the North American tribes as well. So he is tr Jones is making the, um, uh, the point that there was already contact. There was already cultural influence going back and forth between North America, uh, Midwest, North American Midwest, and Mexico. 
Over here, we see another archaeologist at work in the actual Mexican ruins of, I don't know what, but I'm going to guess Teotihuacan, because we have the truncated pyramid there in the back. And above it, you can just see a slight image of the sun and the moon. So maybe this is the temple of the sun and the moon in Teotihuacan, you know, the, the site that's just north of Mexico City. Maybe this, this feathered serpent here is from the, pa the temple of the feathered serpent in that same archaeological place. And it is possible that Jones actually saw those excavations. So he's, he's documenting here the ex how carefully people are studying the, pr the cultures of the past. And the person here is taking a very careful photograph of some in this panel right here, we see a contemporary archaeologist looking at uh, forms that come from cliff dwellers in the American Southwest. Now, it's very likely that the actual objects that are depicted here are ones that he saw in Eli Lilly's collection. And again, you can see how carefully the scientist is going through things to measure things very exactly so that he's inspecting and preserving the past. Over here, of course, is a more contemporary scene that shows us some of our other things that we've inherited from the Native American cultures of North and Central America. Potatoes and corn, both of those plants are native to the New World. And of course, those things, and I think those are, I don't know what those are for sure over there. Maybe soybeans, I don't know for sure. But in any case, these are the plants that are our natural heritage the things that are now the basis of the uh, Iowa agricultural economy. And you can see here that there's an image of a factory and a contemporary person reading a newspaper. And I suppose that is largely to just remind people that now we're talking about our times. It is, typ okay. it is, typical, it is typical of the New Deal murals that Jones attempts not only to depict our history, but to make us feel our connection to it. To look at the past and see both the triumphs and the endurance of those who went before us may have helped Americans suffering through the Depression to put their own situation into historical perspective. It also gives them a sense of their own progress. For example, the widespread cultivation of plants that dependably maintain our food supply in Iowa today. The actors in his mural take care of their heritage at the same time that they build upon it. So the whole idea here is look to the past, learn from the past, carefully preserve the past, and build on it. It is ironic that Iowans, and nearly all of us uh, Americans, nearly lost part of this heritage but we haven't really lost it. It's being given back to us now. And now, the really interesting part of the program is about to begin because the uh, Scott Haskins, who's been doing the actual restoration, is going to come and talk to you. That was so interesting. Thank you very much. I, uh, I loved I could listen to you talk all day long. That's, that was great. Well, I am not so scholarly. I'm sorry that I uh, may put you to sleep. Uh, hopefully not. But I feel a little bit like an archaeologist as we dig through all the mud on these walls and underneath discover something uh, gorgeous. And uh, so I'm going to give you the inside information on uh, how the heck do we do this? And uh, we're going to start out by a quick movie, um, a quick little video that I made. Uh, it's just a couple minutes long, and it's going to show you the cleaning process of removing the paint from off of the murals. So here we go. This quick video shows you the inside information on rediscovering murals that were painted out 50 years ago in City Hall of Cedar Rapids. They are located in what is now the City Council Chambers. These WPA murals were painted in 1936. 
Before the work is begun, extensive testing is done to make sure that by removing the overpaint that the original painting is not damaged in any way. The mural was damaged, however, during previous cleanings. Through the testing process, we learn how the layers will best come off. There are five of them. So at this point, uh, we've done our tests, and uh, we've come up with a safe way to uh, get the five layers of overpaint off of the painting without damaging the original paint and the original artwork. So now uh, we've begun applying it and uh, working in larger areas, trying to get a rhythm down so that we can begin a methodology, as we say it, or a technique uh, to work our way across the wall. So as you can see, we're beginning to uh, make some progress now and the work to go pretty smoothly from here on out. So the cleaning process involves swelling the top layers of paint and then lifting them off. We go down layer by layer and you can see them coming off here until we get to the last layer on the wall. This last layer of paint is then dissolved with solvents that don't hurt or damage the original paint at all. After cleaning, we'll apply an interim varnish that will help the colors brighten up and then we'll inpaint or retouch the previous damage. To see the short video on the inpainting and the final look of the murals, click on the link below. So of course you don't have a link, but uh, these are on YouTube and uh, the videos that you're looking at. And uh, there's also a page on our business website that's dedicated to this. If you Google, uh, if you search uh, on the internet for, uh, let's see, how about City Hall Murals, Cedar Rapids, uh, there will be some articles and things, but one of the things that will come up on the search will be Fine Art Conservation Laboratory's website, and it will take you right to the page where you can see these uh, murals and uh, get other in, uh, in interesting information. So, <clears throat> one of the main questions that we get about uh, how, how do you clean the, how do you do this? How do you get this paint off? And in this case, of course, you can see that we very carefully do tests. We want to know how many layers we have to go through. Usually, those different layers of paint react to solvents or react to removal processes differently. And so, maybe one will dissolve in one thing and then another la layer will dissolve in something else. Well, in this case, we have layers of acrylic paint. Now, why would acrylic paint be used inside of this room? because it's water-based and non-toxic, probably, and it was an option in the 60s, and so when they used it, they didn't have to have it smell bad and dry for two months, and it was just done, and they were done. So uh, that's why they used the acrylic paint inside. If it had been outside, they probably would have used a different kind of paint, and uh, however, the murals themselves are in oil. So you might suspect that the acrylic paint would dissolve in something different than the mural itself will dissolve in, and that is our way in, okay? All right, so uh, that is the process. It's a timing process. It's a, uh, it's a discovery process, and we're going to talk about some new discoveries, but the process is one of first we do this, and then the next step is we do that. And then we do this, and the comment that we get, uh, we just started the east wall this week. And people, the first thing I hear people say is, oh my gosh, you're going so fast. It's coming right off. Well, yes, you get to see an image pretty quickly, but there are about four stages in the cleaning, and we've only done two. There's still plenty of work to do even on these areas that you're looking at. So um, it's a process that requires kind of a big bulky get it off and then there's a finesse off and take care of the final layers so that you get, so that we leave everything original on the wall and we take off everything that doesn't need to be there. That makes sense, doesn't it? Be careful when you get down to the sensitive 
level. Okay, so uh, the next video that we have is about, uh, uh, about the south wall here, is we're gonna look at uh, the in-painting or touch-up process. a varnish before we get started on the end painting. That makes the colors pop better. So we know what colors These chopped out sections show parts of the mural that have come away from the wall. To fix it, Scott injects them with an adhesive to make sure everything gets reattached. Use a varnish based paint that is made specifically for art conservation. Help me from Italy is because she does this so quickly. So uh, after we're done, uh, so the, one of the things that we discover in the process is that there has been damage inflicted on the murals. In other words, uh, a contractor, as he's getting a wall prepared to paint, what might he do? Get out his sander and his uh, whatever that, the palette knife and get out there and scrape down the wall and scratch it up before he puts on the new paint and that's uh, unfortunately what happened on some of these murals so there are areas that we need to um, go in and touch up our process of touching up artwork is called in painting that's the technical term in painting we use a small brush and it's kind of like connecting the dots we don't take out a big old brush and repaint the whole arm of the person because there's a dot of paint missing we take we color match, that's basically what it is. We connect the dots by color matching and it's just bing, ding, ding, ding and all of a sudden everything comes back into focus and it looks great. So uh, what you're left with is a painting that is uh, completely integral. In other words, its complete integrity is still intact. As, uh, as, and what you're looking at is the actual artwork uh, we did not sign our name underneath the artist because of all the work we did on it, because we did not go through and repaint things. I am not an artist, okay? I don't employ artists, okay? And I still have a brother that introduces me as, as an artist. I, I just, it, it, fla it just flabbergasts me that, and I, I, I've been doing this since 1975 and I still have to correct people that I, that I love dearly, that I am not an artist. I have never painted a painting before in my life. And they know this. And I still uh, have to put up with that. Anyway, uh, we are not artists. We don't paint. All we do is save your art. OK. So let's talk uh, quickly about uh, the east wall. <coughs> this is where it gets interesting because the east wall is the reason why the murals were painted out. Uh, back at the time of the New Deal, of course, they had, no, they had no idea that there was going to be a cultural revolution, that rock and roll, sex, and drugs were going to be 
coming along with the uh, Vietnam War and there was going to be a generation, what they call it, a generation gap, but uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, big upheaval in society uh, in the 50s and then full blown in the 60s and, and, um, and those times uh, got, there was quite a reaction on the, from the subject matter in this mural. I've heard said that as a, as a courtroom, the, uh, the jury would sit over here in a trial and then have in front of them on the mural on the other sides an image of a person on the mural that is being hung. In other words, capital punishment. Uh, and, uh, and, and, we did, and that's kind of all I had heard is that thing that uh, that had been painted out and then they decided they wanted to see it again, and they cleaned it off. And then, and then, um, Seth, what was the term that the uh, that that judge used? Uh, it was uh, mural turpitude. Okay, so we're suffering from mural turpitude in this room, uh, and the command went out: paint those murals out. So they were then painted out again right after they were cleaned. And, uh, and it doesn't appear to us that uh, any great skill was used in the uh, cleaning off process uh, because uh, you know there could have been quite a bit of damage. I imagine they just got up there with strippers and, and pallet knives and went at it. In any case, uh, we began our process of cleaning the murals in this right-hand corner. And let me show you a little bit about the cleaning process. Uh, there is no verbal on this, so I'm going to kind of explain it, but I'm going to show you a little bit about the cleaning that we are going through right now. Remember I told you that there's a discovery process? Well, we're going to talk about the discoveries. So, so this quick little video is going to show you the work we're doing right now. This is, of course, what the wall looks like, and here you can see it in front of you how we've been tented in for um, the smells and keep everything under control and keep everybody healthy and happy and everything's being evacuated. This is where we live. We started in this upper right-hand corner. We put, the, uh, we put the swelling solutions on and then we take them off in three or four different uh, processes. And then you can see here I'm lifting it off the wall. Uh, that first layer comes off and then we have to begin taking it off and here we're revealing this lady up in this corner by taking off the couple layers on top of her. Would you put it on pause? And then all of a sudden you can see here, actually move it forward just a little bit, the image. Uh, stop. Okay. This is uh, on, the, on the bench, on the bench of the judges in the very back, there's a long printout of all the murals. And this detail is what we have of that section right there. And you can see here that there's a newspaper. There's, she's holding another newspaper. There's more newspapers up here. She's surrounded by details. Can you go backwards? Good job. Whoops. All right. But this is blank. And apparently there was something there that was objectionable. And it's been removed. Now this was completely unexpected by us. And uh, by us and of course by those that uh, we've, you know, that are in charge of the contract. And uh, so we're, but we, our process is, our process is very exact. We go down layer by layer. We know exactly what's coming off the wall. We are absolutely 100% sure that we didn't remove any newspapers from your mural. But the question is, uh, where did they go? And obviously there was something about the headlines or the, symbol the sim symbolism or something of these newspapers that ha had somebody that was yanking somebody's chain and that was not only painted out, but was stripped off the wall. So, what would your logical next question be? 
Now what do we do? We're going to talk about that, but the question is, is the rest of the wall got that problem? What else on the wall has been just scraped off? And we know that, we, I didn't even know that this was a, uh, you know, a, a problem area, a discussion of the mural. But we do know that there is a hanging going on, and you want to move the, and go ahead, let's, let's finish watching this thing, then we'll talk about this conundrum. So this is the image we have. We, we have actually better images of this to show you. Yeah, but here's, of course, it's just blank. All right, so the other problem area is the hanging. And the hanging is of a blonde person, uh, uh, white, apparently, and stop, please. Okay, uh, if you look on that paperwork there, it tells us on, the, on that big rolled out copy of what the murals are, it puts the, the hanging going on right here. And uh, our, our, uh, our leader and our, our fearless leader said, well, hey, we better get in there and see if the hanging part of this mural is also badly damaged so that we can plan ahead, right? So we jumped to, saluted and said, well, that's all right. Captain, we'll get that off the wall. And so we went after it and that's where we started working. I mean, that's where we started working. And we got like right barely into it. Go ahead. Here we are, we've got, uh, this is, you go ahead, just let it go. See, uh, here we've got it coming off and here we've got the, we get just got started and we can see this isn't the same mural as we think we're looking for. And we've got, and this is, and so we go back to our pictures and we can see that on this big long pictures, somebody's got the sequence out of order. And so we now uncovered part of the mural that uh, uh, we weren't looking for. <laughs> and you can stop that, because I'll come back to that in a minute. Actually, I'll just comment on that quickly right now. Uh, so I told you that we're going through a, a four-step process in this cleaning, right? And you can see how there is a, uh, a haze over this photograph, over this photo, you can see, you can't really even see, you know, what kind of clothes she has on. I mean, it looks like there's kind of a hazy. And in fact, if you look at those, it looks like there's kind of a fog over them. Uh, they're not brilliant. They don't have the pop that these have. That's because there's still a lot more cleaning work to be done on these. So we're just giving you a peekaboo moment. See what, uh, see the process, you can see the, the fellow here with his ribs, that's actually somebody standing in front of an x-ray machine. That part of the wall there shows um, an operating room and some medical stuff going on. And so the fellow there with the x-ray machine, you can see that we're just peeling off the layers to reveal him. And um, but we're just kind of getting started. We've only been here a couple of days and we're, uh, we're moving along. But the section of the wall that has to do with the hanging is down there at the other end and uh, we're actually going to get on that tomorrow morning. <laughs> Captain Fowler. It is. Yep. And in fact, I've got a little treat uh, thanks to Seth. Um, there is on this back shelf behind Seth a pile of photographs of all the walls and there are, if you, the, you can look at the photographs of this wall, uh, which have not been seen for 50 years, and, uh, you can, um, and you can see where the windows are. You can see the cutout of the window, so that'll tell you which images go with that wall as you'll see the windows. Aha, uh -huh. can we repaint the newspapers? All right, that's a great question. Uh, but my time's up, so I can't answer that. I have to. <laughs> Actually, that is uh, the, the golden question right now. Yes, what are we going to do? And, uh, and that is, uh, that's a good question. And it's not actually a very uncommon question. Artwork, public art, has been damaged in the interest of politics for millennia. If you think about it, every new group of politicians coming in 
want the power and they want to get rid of the name of the old pharaoh going out and the new pharaoh coming in wants all the glory, right? Or the Venetian Republic, as they're going out, the new guys coming in are carving off all the lions from off the buildings to, that talk about the, you know, from that. So the out with the old, in with the new, all that kind of, you know, somebody's agenda always trumps somebody else's outgoing agenda. And that's what you've got here is you've got some political thing that has had an effect. Now, in and of itself, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? That kind of adds a whole historical dimension to your mural. That's part of the history of Cedar Rapids and the politics and the uh, discussions going on. And in fact, I, I guess your judge that ordered them painted out is still alive, though not all there mentally, but he's still in your community. So uh, this is an interesting process within our civiliza within civilizations, and uh, and you get to participate, or you get to see that happen here also. But let me tell you, not so much answering what's going to be done here, but let me tell you that there are a few choices. And may I point this out? Would this be all right with you? All right. So uh, one of them, of course, is one of the choices is just to leave it blank. And that, for me, is not such a good choice because um, that's like a sore thumb. You're going to come in this room, and there's going to be a spot with nothing on it, and you're going to say, well, what happened there? And the purists, those who say, no, we only want to have just the vintage 1936 image, we don't want it adulterated with anything added. Well, they might think that's the best option. There are others, uh, which, and this is a very common, uh, they will sketch in the details based on uh, clues they have, and we do have clues uh, from the photographs. And we could sketch in where all the, uh, the pages of the, of the um, newspapers went and give you something of an image there. So it would kind of confuse your eye. I mean, you would have it, com the image would be completed and wouldn't look so empty. Uh, another option would be to go in and put in the images in a way that would complete it and really would blend in pretty well, but it wouldn't be a repainting. So that actually somebody who was paying attention, that really knew what they were looking at would say, oh yeah, that's new and that's original able to see historically what was uh, you know added and what wasn't and then of course there's the idea of just repainting it so that it blends in perfect the problem with that is we don't know what that looks like and we don't want to invent okay we're not decorators we don't this uh, now if we were Swiss Swiss reinvent repaint and uh, and uh, make everything look perfect uh, and you walk in, you look at a 500-year-old building, and it looks like it was put up, you know, 10 years ago. So there are cultures around the world. I think the Japanese and the Chinese are also the same. Uh, they love to see stuff look perfect. So if you like buying um, Chinese antiques, beware, because they love to just completely redo them. You never know what's original, and it has restoration on it, and what is your actual authentic antique item. In this case, uh, we don't know what the original colors were because we only have black and white photographs. Although we're looking for right now the, uh, the, uh, the submittals, they're called. In other words, the plans or the design work or the drawings. Uh, there would have been two things that the artist would have submitted. They would have submitted a drawing showing the composition for the wall and he would have had something in color which would have shown, of course, the color scheme for the room that they would have been interested in. So there used to be something that showed color, and it probably would have been hand drawn and hand colored, but they didn't have color photography back then. So we're on the hunt, looking for everything we can right now to show us what goes there and what color it was so that we have the choice. But the decision has not been made yet about what we're going to put back in there. The question 
that we will find the answer to tomorrow. And you're right on the cutting edge of this discovery is there anything over there that, uh, is there anything left? Or was that scraped off the wall? So tomorrow, off the paint, we're going to see if we have a missing section of mural or whether we're doing pretty good. These murals that we've uncovered look great. They're in great shape. They don't look like they've been damaged. And we're, we're thrilled. So we're thinking that maybe, uh, why would they have just, I don't understand why they would have scraped off the newspapers if they were going to paint it out. Why do you need to do that and paint it out? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Anyway, that is, yes. You can ask if you talk into a mic. And maybe it's the city manager's uh, answer, but who, who will get to make that decision? Sandy? Uh, excuse me, you're going to need a mic. Um, I'm Sandy Fowler. I'm the assistant city manager. Um, Jeff's here with us, actually, um, behind you, the city manager. Um, we have decided to ask the Visual Arts Commission to help us make that decision. Um, a group of citizens that are appointed by the city council. So yeah, there's some people in this room who will be in on that decision. Um, we appreciate the, the Visual Arts Commissioners, uh, those citizen volunteers who serve on that commission, and, um, and we will have Scott work with, with that commission to make the decision about what to do. But once it's all uncovered, we know what we're dealing with. I am not a bully, and I will not make them do something, of course. I'm, uh, I'm gonna be a consultant, and, uh, and I'm happy to follow through with whatever they want to do. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Hold on, let me give you a mic. Were the uh, murals originally painted on canvas? Were they painted elsewhere and then brought in and applied to the wall? Or were, was the canvas applied to the wall and was the mural painted on site here? Very good question. Uh, the process of painting on a canvas at your studio and then bringing them on location is a technique as far as I know uh, was begun by the French in the middle of the 1700s maybe this maybe the even the first quarter of the 1700s and the uh, the idea of course is that uh, they're not underfoot from the contractors in the room in the building they're they're home taking, they've got the measurements. In fact, they might even uh, paint the whole wall and then once they get to the location, cut out all the details from the architecture. But they would paint them at home or paint them in their studio, bring them here, install them, and then do the finish work. So they might do the bulk of the work in the studio and then, and then come here and, uh, and then attach them and then finish them off and might even make adjustments and changes and you know things like that. Uh, the the uh, back then they the, what they used to attach the canvas to the wall was a starch paste. Uh, that sometimes oh, uh, historically uh, that starch paste was sometimes mixed with an animal glue. Uh, the uh, and then uh, they they also tried using in in the interest of per because that glue. Uh, had a, um, especially in humid climate, climates, uh, could be attacked by mold and uh, would respond to, um, uh, you know, would break down with time. They were thinking about what's permanent. And they, the most permanent thing that artists can think of in their production is something like lead white paint. And so they would use uh, lead based white here murals, which was the kiss of death, really, if you're trying to get them out of the building. If the building's going to be demolished. And I was, I was looking at murals from the same time period uh, at a military base in Florida. And um, they really liked these murals, but they were knocking down the building because the building was being eaten alive by black mold. And uh, they, I went to Florida to see what it would take to get them out and they were glued down with this white lead that uh, just to get them out of the building was going to be $300,000. And that didn't have anything to do with the restoration of the murals or getting them someplace else. 
and it was a it was a deal breaker. So um, they but those are and that lead white material is used internationally. It's uh, but it's uh, those are I think that's more answer than you wanted, but I think that thoroughly answered your question. Yes. Yep. Uh, and my answer to that was that the normal process was that you paint them in your studio to stay out of the way from contractors and from people working in the building. And also, because to paint these murals here, you've got to set up camp for a month. And, and that was done that way. But I'm just saying, commonly, the murals uh, were uh, worked on in the studio, and then they also, they had to work on them here. They had to work on them here because uh, they had to finish off work. They had, uh, you know, they would damage them, bring them. They're almost always damaged when they bring them from the studio. Uh, they would get here and somebody, uh, one of their clients would say, uh, you know, we want to change this or do something different. And so there is work on site being done but one of the main reasons for doing it on canvas is to, is to uh, facilitate and to reduce the time that they have to be camped out here. These are all painted on canvas and glued to the wall. Excuse me, just one other thing. Uh, this, uh, if you took all the air, uh, and obviously canvas, the attachment of the canvas kind of depends partially on the skill of the canvas installer. Sometimes they would employ wallpaper guys to help them out. They're not, they're good at putting up wallpaper, but they're not so good at doing a good job on protecting murals when they put them up. And, uh, and if you took all the spots where the canvas had detached on this wall, uh, I could, you, I could pro you could probably put all of the detachments into an area that's maybe this big, not very much area. About 50% of that wall's canvas is detached. And I've got a major reattachment part of this project that I'm going to be undertaking. You've run into the issue of, of eradicated uh, uh, images. So what have you done and what have been the decisions made to, to either put an image back in or what, what, have we, what have you done in the past? Well, all of the four options that I gave you. Because I need to know. Yeah, all, all, of, the four, all of the four options that, I've, th that I gave you are ones that we've done before. And one is leave it. Uh, well, I can tell you the one that I like the best and I like the one where we, uh, where you put it in and it's nicely camouflaged, but doesn't look exactly perfect as being, we're not trying to imitate the artist and make it look like a shiny penny brand new. So I'll just, uh, just very briefly jump in. Um, I'll do, uh, I think we're kind of going into Q&A now, so I'll walk around with the mic. There's a lady in the corner. Do you know how long it took to do the wall? I mean, like, each of these walls, how long it would have taken? I don't have any idea. I have no idea. But Seth may have that answer. No, he doesn't. Uh, there are a number of people that have, Do you know, Leah, how long it might have taken the, doc, the artists to paint these murals? I think it took well over a year. It was a long involved process by the time you sent all your things into the federal uh, New Deal agency and then to actually paint it. So I, I, I think they were at it for pr probably pretty close to a year. The actual painting process can go pretty quickly. Um, a, a couple of years ago, uh, 
there was something I enjoyed in the news. Uh, they, one of the great master works of art uh, in the world is the